Welcome back, everybody, to your Creativity Pandemic Edition um, 3.0, 4.0, whatever version we are in this world. <laughs> How are you today, Steve? Doing great. Loving the self-isolating stuff. Yeah, I'm so lonely. <laughs> <laughs> you have the web. There's, you, there's a lot you can do on the internet, Dylan. I know, but I, I think I'm running out of it. Uh, <laughs> but but today we've got a special guest. Uh, um, oh, oh, sure. Okay. Yep. Sorry. No, it's okay. Today we've got a special guest. Um, he is a bookseller, and he's seen on uh, Antique Roadshow and all over the place. Uh, we're here with Ken Sanders. How are you today, Ken? I wish I knew, Dylan. You know, we're taking it hour by hour, day by day. I didn't particularly like waking up this morning and reading first thing online that the the uh, orange menace in Washington is now insisting on signings everybody's stimulus check so he gets his, even though he's too stupid to know that he's not legally allowed to sign them. So he's holding everybody's checks up in order to get his name printed on them. That's just not a good way to start the day. No, we got a no. bat shit crazy and apology bats everywhere. Guy running us to ruin now and causing us to die. That's kind of heavy first thing in the morning. It is. Yeah. It's... That, that, hey, Ken, that's why I just sleep in. And then, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, so it's not as bad at like one in the afternoon as getting up early. Yeah, well, the 3 a.m. is when I have difficulty, especially when we keep getting the goddamn earthquake after <laughs> they call them. That um, was nuts last night. Fortunately, I, I, slept, I was asleep. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> oh. I felt, I have not felt them since the first day we had some. Lucky you. So does that does that mean that my house is safe? I would think so, yes, since you're not yes, feeling Steve, yeah, yeah, completely safe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. that's. If you that's can't right. feel the earthquake, yeah, <laughs> certainly nothing wrong. No, nope. good. <laughs> my house, uh, I got. I'm I'm about oh, I don't know 500 feet away from a little uh, fault line park up here by the university. <laughs> guess, guess what fault? The Wasatch fault. It's nobody's fault. No, yes, it is. It's the Wasatch fault. And, but you, okay, so you're more than just like a book person. You're a movie star. Ah. I know this because you were in Trolls too. <laughs> I, I have been in two Trent Harris movies. Um, yeah. Undelightful water universe, which nobody's ever seen, uh, where I play a uh, barman bouncer to, it was shot inside the twilight, and poor Bill, Bill Allred from X96 is the down and out journalist that keeps handing me credit card after credit card that are all decline, decline, and then he tries to sneak out the back door of the dive bar, and my, my big scene is running down the alley at my bookstore in slow motion, trying to catch him as he goes into a car, the getaway car. And I guess, uh, I guess uh, I kind of went a little over the top because I started shaking the car and trying to pick it up and push it over. And I terrified everybody in the car, the cameraman, Trent, and everyone else. <laughs> okay, that's good. In a film sense. <laughs> it's good to scare Bill every now and then. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Steve. You got to make your mark. You got to be memorable. So we, you, you're a bookseller, and um, be, before all this, you were you were struggling because you you potentially have to move because of uh, development downtown. Do you have any new uh, updates on that? Yeah, right, Dylan. So I got some good news and some bad news for you. Okay. Oh yes, the the entire block of Second East being developed from second south to third south uh there's already uh, luxury condos going up on second and second the middle of the block is blighted and taken over by the homeless they've tried to burn the buildings down twice um 
and it's a whole big giant mess right up to my parking lot and then the green ant on greens next to me and the developers uh, held a, a press release and announcement and contest a few months ago that they're going to start to develop get ideas from architectural students on developing our part of the block and what should be built there and it's like well excuse me that that means that you're ter finally after five years of not knowing they're tearing us down so we were not we were given, we were given notices that possibly as soon as january of 2021 we would be gone so that's the bad news and so i've got to plan well what do i do for the future the yeah. problem is was still is what i'm doing now isn't sustainable i can't rent 4000 5000 square feet of downtown property for a price i can afford to pay and continue the model of selling we sell a lot of three to twenty dollar used paperbacks and hard books hardback books that the community loves. i can't run the empire off no matter how many of those sales i get i need the four and five figure sales to keep the empire going so trying to find square footage that i could afford downtown it's not possible we were looking at as many alternatives as we could i'm not really especially now i can't really talk about them some of them still could come true but the silver lining is with the earthquake well not so much the earthquake but the the uh, coronavirus 19 covid 19 pandemic um the development has been on halted and put on hold and definitely we don't know how long so likely instead of being evicted at the beginning of 2021 maybe i've got till the end of 2021 so maybe we do get to live but we have to survive the pandemic first and what, whenever that happens to happen yeah are we in the beginning of it the middle of it near the end how would anyone know i'm a bookseller what do i know i'm 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 imagining you know armies of invisible viruses you know creeping around my house running around <laughs> the kitchen the bathroom the bedroom god knows where i mean what is what does the coronavirus look like man uh so so we i i you know i'm a fighter i don't give up we are we are certainly are sitting around waiting with bated breath to see, do we get grants? Do we get loans? Is anybody going to help us? And I do need to give a shout out to Mayor Mendenhall for jumping right into her brand new mayorship. Uh, her years, I think, on the city council has really paid off with her expertise of knowing how to a local government. She got right on it and formed an emergency loan fund. And I can tell you, and I'm very grateful to the mayor and the city council and everyone that's working on an emergency loan fund that we were granted and have that money and that's what i'm using to keep all six of us six of us on the payroll here at the bookstore thank you mayor mendenhall that didn't start i'm not sure i would be alive the bookstore would be alive i'll be alive i weigh so much at this point i don't think i could starve to death even if i had no food here <laughs> Well, Steve's got a whole shop full of chocolate, so you can probably go right there. Yeah, you can come eat here for a day or two. Hey, yeah, well, I, so Ken, yes, what, Steve. What, what, what was your first book you read, or that you remember reading? Well, my late mother, um, she, she, my mom says I was born reading a book. Now, possibly that's an exaggeration. Uh, there are a lot of childhood pictures of me with the books in my hand. Uh, I haven't been able to make out the title of one of them yet. But some of my <laughs> favorites, uh, I do a, uh, um, I, uh, it, it's a book called The Princess and the Goblin by George MacDonald and its sequel, The Princess and Curdie. Oh, just killer, killer stuff. I ate it up. I, I loved, I loved, I, I read every book in Woodrow Wilson Elementary School, not literally, but every one that was of interest to me. That would mean I did not read any of the math, science, physics, or chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a word guy. <laughs> but, but, uh, all, I mean, Mrs. Pitt, Miss Pitt, 
Rumble goes to Mars, Danny Dunn and the anti-gravity paint. Oh, and my all-time favorite, Alice in Wonderland. The Oz books by L. Frank Baum. Most people don't know there are 40 different Oz books by Baum, Ruth Thompson, and the famous illustrator of the series, John R. Neal. I just, I mean, I just forged myself on books and, 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 and still do. In fact, going off tangents, but then that's what I like to do. Uh, I started tomorrow night will be episode three of story time with Ken Sanders. And I've started a really, really corny uh, podcast, zoom cast, whatever, like what we're doing right now, except it's just me. It's not interactive. And I, I got to tell you as a, a, a lifelong Luddite trying sitting there for an hour, reading books to an imaginary audience, staring at my ugly mug on the screen as a little disconcerting. <laughs> Without my producer walking me through it, I could never ever do it. But I'm having a ball. I'm reading tomorrow night. We're doing Shell Silverstein. Shell Silverstein read aloud was how did a Playboy cartoon buddy a Hugh Hefner's hung out at the Playboy Mansion in Chicago a lot become a best-selling children's author, to mention the hundreds, if not thousands of songs that he wrote that country, western, and rock bands uh, got famous off of, like Get Your Picture on the Cover of the Rolling Stone, Johnny Cash's uh, A Boy Named Sue, The Irish Rovers, The Humpty Bock Beasts, The Green Unicorn, you see what I mean about that singing voice now? And hundreds of he wrote entire albums for huge country stars. How did she Shelley Belly become this world famous children's book author and illustrator? It, I just love stuff like that. So uh, six to 7 p.m. every Thursday, it'll be the third installment of my new kitty show. I have, I have special guests and I have running gags and props. And, uh, I'm having a lot of fun with it. So that's one but way. How do you how do people, where do people log in to find it? Oh, uh, you can go to our Facebook page and my producer assures me that now that we're doing it at my house, that this, the internet's so screwed up at the store, we can't live stream YouTube, it's not working. But she assures me we'll be on, but we have a Ken Sanders Rare Books YouTube channel and we have a email and a newsletter that we sent out today that has the the urls where you you go to get on these things i i don't know what i'm talking about <laughs> but when it comes to kids books i do i but caught the last he, one and it was lots of fun uh it i i'm gonna ham up more i give shout outs my my grandkids uh, who just barely escaped london to come back to California, got on a plane. They they upgraded all the miles to business miles. So the three of them, mom and the two kids, were the only three people on the plane in business class. But the families reunited and they got to watch it. And I love to call my grandchildren uh, rat-faced Kaporians, which I did live on air. And they back home, it cracked them up because it's not the first time they've been called that. <laughs> So I'm really having fun with that. I'm I'm gonna try and launch an adult one, Dylan. I wanna I wanna do I just you know poems for the pandemic though that's too cheap and alliterative to be the title, but I wanna do serious you know adult stuff. The Wendell Berry. We should have been listening to Wendell Berry 50 years ago. You know you know what this is all about, guys. It's really really simple. Mother Nature is pissed at us and. We should have been listening to her some decades back. And yeah. If we're not over the tip and she, she's gonna, you know, slap us around here to teach us a lesson and get her to get us to pay attention because she doesn't like the fact that they're, we're poisoning the earth, the water, the skies. We're we're dying off the the, the coral reefs. We're moving the Arctic and the Antarctic glaciers. She is pretty. PO'd and we better get with it. Greta Thunberg is right. She's my new hero. Yeah, mine too. She's amazing. Now, uh, Ken, give us a little history about the store. Is this the first location for it? Oh. Well, it's, uh, I've always been in the book trade. I was wheeling and dealing comic books in grade school. 
you know, for a nickel, not so much as a business, but if I could buy a comic book for a nickel and trade it to the next sucker and get two more comic books back, then I had twice as many comics. That, that's about as complicated in math as I can do. Um, and I just, just expanded by there. At 14, I was a serious book collector. I was, I was buying Arthur Rackham's and Maxwell Parrish's and Jesse Wilcox Smith illustrated, beautifully illustrated editions of Alice in Wonderland, a gigantic folio edition of Pose the Raven, full page engravings from uh, Gustave Dore. Oh, I just ate it all up. I, I ran my own mail order business in the 60s while I was still a teenager out of high school. Um, somebody from California came back home to Utah and blown my mind with underground comic books like Robert Crumb and such and Zap. So I was selling all these underground comic books in the 60s in fanzine advertisements and mail order. And I, I didn't know what typesetting was, so I'd buy those endless sheets of rub-off lettering. I have no talent as an ad designer. So they would be crooked and they'd run upside down and they would get my fingerprints all over them. And I would sell underground comic books by mail order and I'd have these things. You must be 18 to buy these comics. But of course, I wasn't 18, but hell, I was selling them, not buying them. <laughs> so I've always been involved in books. I Technically, my very, very first job in the book world and a, a guy I knew back in the 60s, Don Bowles, started a little paperback trade store in Sugar House called Central Book Exchange. And though Don's long gone, the bookstore had, has had a new owner for a long, long time and seemingly is thriving and is still in the same location as it was back in the 60s. When I worked there, I was supposed to make a dollar an hour. But trading paperbacks and only taking 10 cents in per trade, per book, often didn't fill the coffers with that kind of money. Yeah. So I gleefully took my salary out in trade. <laughs> then I worked to, I worked to, at Sam Weller's uh, on Main Street. I worked uh, one summer at Collector's Bookstore on Hollywood Boulevard, just below Vermont Avenue. Uh, let me tell you, a teenage boy from Salt Lake, loose on Hollywood and Sunset Avenues. Holy mother of God, was that an experience? <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> in 19, summer of 1970. And then uh, my old uh, buddy, Steve Jones, who had started the Cosmic Airplane at 9th and 9th in s the summer, spring of 67. He, in the 70s, he approached me in 74 to manage. He, he had always wanted a bookstore. Uh, he, he had a, a would-be partner. Uh, Bruce Roberts, they're both deceased now. Steve and Bruce are gone. I'm the only one left. Um, they approached me about managing this new bookstore. Uh, I talked my way into a three-way partnership and we found this location and remodeled it in 75 and I set up uh, the bookstore in my old house side and ordered books from publishers. I, our very, very first employee worked in a spare bedroom in that house for a year before we ever opened. Her name was, uh, she's an artist here in Salt Lake now named Lucy Fairchild. She was the Cosmic's very bookstore. There were other incarnations of Cosmic, mind you, before them. So 1976, next door to the Blue Mouse Theater and up the street from uh, the Cinegrill restaurant on First South, kind of where nostalgia coffee would be now. Uh, we opened a bookstore, Cosmic Airplane Books and Records, and uh, it took off and it was a wild, wild ride. And then from then I founded Dream Garden Press in 1980, my publishing company uh, for a long, then I went through a bunch of financial uh, distress for about a decade. I was holed up out in the South Salt Lake in buildings that my, my parents owned. And then in 97, the space I'm in now uh, became open. The last thing I ever intended to do was to open again. But my daughter, who was then 16 years old, and I uh, started it. And now look at me now. 
Can we call Wait, it a pandemic so she, instead of demic? Did she ditch you by 17 years old, or how long did she stay involved? Oh, for about 10 years. Um, it, <clears throat> on a good day, it's very, very difficult to work for me, but try being <laughs> my daughter. I, I have a lot of sympathy for, for, for her not wanting to do that. She actually, for a while, uh, started her own she she loves homemade books and artist books and things like that and she started her own red queen book arts for a while but it's not currently active you you've seen the cycle of book reading and i mean you saw the digital age where like the ebooks came on yes and, of the book you, blah 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 you, but i also i mean are, they're saying now that e, real books actually are coming back in a big way because people miss actually touch, touching the texture, the, the, all of that. How, what are your thoughts on all of that? Don't forget, they like to smell the books. That's very important. When people used to be allowed to come in my store, that's what they would talk about. Oh my gosh, I love the way this place smells. And it was right after the janitors came, so it wasn't because it was filthy, that it's the smell of books decaying and people are addicted to that smell. Look, this whole, as you point out, the whole internet, digital, ebook thing, so what? I don't care. True bibliophiles live in a far distant corner of the universe. Books are never gonna go away. We're never gonna go away. And it's not just people my age. I've got three youngsters working for me right now and they're they're book people they're 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 one of us we're not going to go away remember bradbury's fahrenheit 451 when they burn all the books the true bibliophiles and the book renegades lived out in the woods outside the long arm of the orange law and they became the books themselves and would walk around reading shakespeare and dickens and their own favorite books they became the books we'll become the book. books aren't going anywhere they'll be around us as long as there's a civilization left and that's an open question and to, to produce them and make them always be readers i'm not worried Um, business-wise or um, author-wise or musician-wise, who, who's inspired you through your life? Oh boy, it's, that's a big question, Dylan. Um, I've always loved music as much as I've loved books. Um, I'm a vinyl junkie. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I, I just scored 19. Uh, I have one right here. 19 Anthony Braxton uh, albums right here. He's the brilliant uh, Chicago, what you'd call free player now, art ensemble of Chicago, Chicago, Lester Bowie, Malachi Flavors, and, and um, um, Roshan Roland Kirk, and Alt Richard Abrams, all, all those guys that just I was wild about you know, back in the 60s, Delmark and Nessa Records. They call it free jazz now, but that didn't exist then. Bookwise, as I said, as a child, Alice in Wonderland has always been a, been a favorite. But, and, but, and over the years, just, you know, you can't, it's like picking favorite children. There's different things about the books that you like. Flatland uh, by Edwin Abbott is a mathematical farce and a fantasy, a romance in one dimension, which I always recommend. Eric Hoffer, a New York State longshoresman turned philosopher, wrote probably two dozen or more books, but The True Believer is one of the best books you could ever read to get into the psyche of why people believe what they do, which is, I would say, really puzzling right now. Um, Viktor Frankl's uh, great uh, psychiatric work, um, oh Lord, see I'm having a senior moment, it was absolutely must reading. And of course I'm really, really passionate about uh, man's search for meaning. Uh, I'm really, really passionate about fiction and novels. Um, 
I love Moby of Don Quixote. I love Huckleberry Finn. Uh, these are some of the great novels. I'm a huge poetry fan. Walt Whitman, Allen Ginsberg, Emily Dickinson, Edgar Allan Poe, the Raven is so inspiring. And I think given the time we live in it right now, it's time to go back and read all my Franz Kafka the books from when I was in high school. Um, I mean, I, I could go on for hours just listing my favorite. So one of, I think, the greatest novelists of the second half of the 20th century is Cormac McCarthy. Uh, uh, his brilliant Blood Meridian, The Border Trilogy, uh, The Road, No Country for Old Men, etc., etc., etc. My old friend Edward Abbey, we need him now more than ever. Desert Solitaire, the Monkey Wrench Gang. My old friend, Chuck Bowden, gone five years now. His, 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 his book called Blood Orchid, An Unnatural History of America, is really, really important. Wendell Berry. Wendell Berry has been, he's a Kentucky farmer, poet, essay, novelist, and one of the, I think, America's most living writers. Uh, I have been reading, going back, he's written more than 60 books. Here's an anthology of his poems called This Day, uh, Collected in New Sabbath Poems. Um, and if you'll permit me, Dylan, I'd like to read one that I think is really, really pertinent to our times. Totally, go ahead. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't name his uh, poems, they just have numbers. There is Wendell on the back cover. Oh, just, yeah. Awesome. He's, uh, I've had the privilege of knowing Wendell Berry for almost 40 years. And I, really admire and respect his work and we should have been listening to him for all these 50 years. <clears throat> Wait, there was something. Where? Sorry, stand by for technical details. Is this the one? Yep. Let us not condemn the human beings appointed to serve the machines. Poor humans, so weak of mind, so self-misled, so willing to risk heroic wrong. What's the satisfaction in condemning the self-condemned? Let them be answered by themselves, who grow smaller, their great works uglier, more lethal, day by day. As we wish ourselves to be spared the fatal numbering. Let us not confound offenders with offenses. May they come to mercy and to peace, but damn their bank accounts inflated by the spent breath of all the earth, of species forever changed to money. Let their legal falsehoods, corpses incorporated that cannot see or feel, think, or care that eat the world and shit money fry in hell in their own fat. May their incarnate steel and fire that destroy the mountains forever be damned. May the chemicals be damned, the poison, the rivers, and damned too, the alien slop and fume the spoil, the air, the water, and all the living world, sold, soiled, or burned. May the plastic trash that defiles lands and oceans, the machines that destroy the work of human hands, the mind-destroying mechanical dreams, be damned, completely damned, be damned also to the incorporation operations of industrial war that is the triumph of every machine that will destroy any life and every life, any place and every place for victory 
that always is E. May the heartless speech of machines that break the heart of the smallest wholeness and may the radiant waste that has made geniuses, idiots, ever be damned. It's poor religion that can't provide a sufficient curse when needed. But if you condemn the dire shortcuts and devices of the engineers, confess that you condemn yourself. You too belong to that litter and so must enter your guilty plea and so must come to your work. You must go ahead in opposition to the mechanical life, continuing also the creaturely task longer than your life of correcting yourself. Wendell Berry. That was really cool. That was, that was good. He's talking to us. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Hey, hey Ken. The, okay, so Yo, it kind of, it talked a little in there, but how do you define success? Or what is success to you? Uh, for, I, for either yourself or for all of us? Uh, well, Mad's short, snappy answer, having more books than I can possibly read and more records that I can possibly listen to. Remember that Mad Magazine used to have this, uh, Mad's uh, snappy answers to idiot questions or some such thing. But, but thinking about, I mean, we've all really been thinking about things a lot with what we've been going through for the past month or six weeks, whatever it's been. You know, what is truly important? What is valuable? And it isn't things. I mean, as much joy and pleasure that I've got down my things. I mean, I'm a collector. I, I, if stuff amuses me, if it gives me pleasure, I like it. And I don't think there's anything inherently wrong or evil with that. But as the famous uh, torch singer sang, sang, is that all there is? And the answer is no. Life is in, in, it's it's about family. It's about the people that you love around you, whether you're related to them or not. And it's about the air outside right now. It's so clear. I can look across the valley. Oh, there are actually clouds out there, so I can't see the Ochre Mountains. But I don't remember the air in this valley smelling and tasting so clean since I was a child 60 years ago. I don't think you can put a value on that. And that we, as Wendell alluded to, if we sell off our birthright of clean air and, the, and, clean, and clean water and clean earth that we take sustenance from, you can't put a price on those kind of things and you can't put a price on community and people doing things together because especially with the self-isolation all of a sudden simple things like a hike or a walk or a bike ride or, or you know a river trip uh, all of a sudden oh oh i really want to do that oh i really miss doing that and these things are they're priceless. Do we really want to go back to that money grubbing, dirty world that we left a few weeks ago? We've got to take this opportunity to, to change things. And I don't know if we can do it. And um, What do you think our so. future is? Well, we'll always have conversations. <laughs> they're, they're proven survivors and there's the new species we call the human cockroach that comes in both red and blue <laughs> I, I though i really shouldn't compare the evil in this world to the creature in it because that is not fair to the insects the mammals the birds to 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 call these odious people by their names. That's, that's shameful of me. I need to get more original with my, my blasphemies. In our closing minutes, I want to talk about Antique Roadshow 
uh, for a few minutes. So you, you started being on there on season 11? I believe so. It was, it was they'd, they'd been in Salt Lake once before and they came, they came back. And the first time they'd been here, they really had nobody, they didn't know what they were getting into and they had nobody on, on well, staff, volunteer. The appraisers are all volunteers. It's a myth that we, we get paid. We, we, they buy us breakfast and lunch and we pay all our own expenses, uh, hotels, airfares, meals, whatever. Uh, we're volunteers. We do, we do it for the fun of it and the notoriety, I guess. Um, it's challenging to do. Yeah, so they, they called me up. Uh, one of the producers called me up a few weeks before the show was coming back to the uh, um, Salt Palace. And he, uh, he said, uh, I've been trying to find somebody with some experience, you know, in Mormon books and Mormon collectibles. And every person I talk to says it's you. So they brought me on the set. I had to do a little practice, you know, appraisal thing. And, and uh, they sat me down at the book table. Well, one of the books, that, there was an auction house guy there I didn't know, and a bookseller I did know, Ken Gloss from the Brattle Bookshop, who was an old time reader on the show. And he really took me under his wings. And they don't really teach you how to do anything. They just throw you out there and you sink or swim. And I'll never have it as good as that first, first day in Salt Lake because, uh, you know, people came with all this fabulous Mormon stuff. Um, I've never, they'll never ever let film that many times ever, ever again. <laughs> and clearly I must have provided something to the show that they valued because uh, um, they've been back to Salt Lake a third time now and they're in their 24th year, I believe it is. And although the whole show got canceled the spring, April, May, and June, uh, it is going to appear in the fall sometime, uh, is what I've been told. Uh, and people like the show. It's certainly given me a made me a big fish in a little pond back home here in Salt Lake City, and it, it's fun. Um, it's it can be challenging too, it can sharpen you up because you get exposed to a lot of material that you've never seen before in your life, and you don't have to say what it is. So do, do, do you have an idea of what they're bringing in so you can kind of research Absolutely it a little bit? Absolutely not. New. It's all, it, the furniture folks, they, they do prearrange and bring that into the set. And those folks are lucky because they can, you know, kick it around the day before and do all the research that they want to. Uh, there might, it, it's really, really hard. There's three of us at the book table when s some shows we are just slammed. So technically you can take a lunch. You could, you know, get on your laptop or look something up. And occasionally I'll try and do that on the fly. So when we do film, because you know, we're doing like this three minute segment that I get my facts right. I might have to look up a birth or a death date of an author or when an author was in Paris or not or what data book was a few things like that that perhaps I've forgotten or I, I never knew in the first place and then you just go out there and film it I mean yeah it's taped and they they edit it later and I'm telling you whoever those editors are make us look like geniuses it's amazing what a good editor can do and you just go out there and have fun with it and try and make the guests, some guests are more nervous than others, and you get all time. Some of them, you know, the, the biggest takeaway I have from the show is I had to learn, and we all do this, is we talk over each other. And as you gentlemen would know, we can't edit film with that if we're talking over each other. So yeah. I had to learn how to listen to them and then start to say my piece, but then talk over me. So you just like become your own editor and you just, oh, okay, pause, go backwards, wait for them to finish and start again. Sometimes the minute you talk, they talk. One time I had a really sweet elderly woman who was uh, much deafer than I am and she could not heard anybody was saying to her. So all she did was talk and talk and talk. How they edited that and made it into something I never know. Yeah, it could be very people. challenging and a heck of a lot of fun. And the best part is the crew that you work with, the staff, the producers, all the folks uh, behind the scenes and your fellow colleagues and appraisers. I have learned so much. 
Well, that, that's awesome. Yeah, and I, I know we're going to get cut off, but we should have you back sometime again. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm happy. to. Now that we've figured this out, and I actually, I, a month ago, I couldn't have done this. But this, this was okay. easy. I, know how to, I actually know how to do it now. Well, well, let's not go that far. I think I could make it. <laughs> Yeah, Steve, Dylan, I would be more than happy to. Uh, it's been a weird trip trying to, you know, we we started in on this, Dylan, uh, pre, pre-pandemic, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, we did. And we had a couple dates set up and they, they just, things came up. And, but we're here now. Um, is, is there, where, how can people help you currently? Well, uh, we can, we are really pressing uh, mail order, internet order, phone order. If you call in the shop, we have a, a small crew of folks that will do their best to find a special book for you or your child. Uh, one of my employees, Amber, has start, has gung ho, has taken on this. She's doing this social media phenom of delivering books all over the valley. It was her idea, and she is just running running or driving with it, as the case may be, uh, buy gift certificates. It's a great way to support us. Uh, We're offering to pay you back 125%. So if you buy a $100 gift certificate, when you redeem it, we'll give you $125 in books or whatever you want. Um, yeah, do, if you can, do support us. We're, we're looking at this long term to figure out how to how do we reemerge from this as a viable bookstore can continue for you know another 10 years? Uh, I'm in awe of what um, the famous City Lights, Lawrence from Getty's City Lights bookshop. He's, he's with us, he's in, in 103 or something. Um, the woman that is managing and running the store, uh, a week or so ago, they started a GoFundMe site. And thanks to the likes of very famous authors, um, they raised something like four hundred thousand dollars in a week. It's amazing. Well, I, I, I'm not that famous, and I don't quite need that much money. We may consider doing something like that, but I'm also dealing to me, Steve. It's important to give it back. We're trying to my 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 uh, children's book show we're doing weekly. Uh, we're designating people like the Utah Food Bank and Utahns Against Hunger, uh, people like that to raise cash and encourage our listeners to give them money for people that have lost their jobs and don't have anything and have rents to pay and kids to feed. We're trying to do our best in our own small way to do that. We've turned the entire front of the bookstore, that was our famous dollar book wall, and for as long as the pandemic ends, where it has hundreds and hundreds, we keep it stuffed full of books of every subject available, and they're all free. You can come down. We've had to put up social distancing rules and marks on the sidewalk. Uh, so people keep their difference, but you need your board at work, come down and get it, get a free book where as, as we try to figure out how to help ourselves and save ourselves, um, we're also trying to reach out to the community. I have been a bookseller in for dang near years and trying to help at the same time as we need help. As everyone keeps saying, we're all in this together. <laughs> So we have a couple, a few bonus questions for you. Um, okay. Who is your favorite Muppet and why? Hmm. Well, my favorite Muppet uh, is Oscar the Grouch. <laughs> well, because he has a prickly personality like uh, I sometimes can have. You don't. You won't see that side of me on the the Kitty Show. But as Wendell Berry, when he was out here in 1989 for the Ed Abbey Wake we held north of Arches, uh, and Wendell does not like adulation from his fans. He does not get for it. He has no use for it. So he was always saying, "Well, if you want a different opinion of me, just ask my wife." <laughs> Love it. And then uh, in the movie of your life, who would you want to play you? Well, to, for me, far more important than who plays me is who plays my girlfriend. That's a, a much more interest to me. Than. So who would you want to play your girlfriend? Uh, I, I'm so old now that I don't even know the names of the, the great hot actresses of our time, you know. 
uh, uh, Ingrid Bergman, is she still around? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Steve, do you have any more questions for him? No, I don't. I don't know if it's still recording. So I'm. I'm kind of. Um, as far as I how, know, how, it how, is. how do we know? Well, it's it's, it's just magic, Ken. If not, we're going to have to repeat this whole hour worth of talking. <laughs> it didn't work at all, right? Well, I know we're doing uh, our virtual cocktail hour every Saturday night with this drinking club of ours. We even got our favorite bartender to be on it with us last week. Oh, and, oh my God. it's only supposed to be an hour and it's a zoom thing but we just kept talking and I, I mean we could still talk to each other whether somebody's recording it or not i don't know yeah it's still still showing i am not the one to ask about technology questions <laughs> and i, and I want to like team up with you down the road too so let's figure let's out how it. we can do it and i want to get together i do i actually need some chocolate I'll try to drop some down when when things get a with, little going normal. Okay, with with the bill, I I want to. I didn't get to send my children a uh, an Easter basket, and they're they're kind of used to getting books from me, shall we say? <laughs> my <laughs> my daughter in law once said, "Well, Ken, you know there are other children have other relatives that also send them books, but they send them." To, to them one or two at a time. I said, yeah, I know. So what? I, Boring, so folks. I, when they first told me they were having uh, Flynn, I took my daughter-in-law aside and I said, look, I'm going to do everything in my power not to be that horrible father-in-law that gives you guys the worst kind of gifts that you hate and you pretend to like and you give them to the goodwill as soon as I'm gone. But there is one thing you know you can't do anything about, right? Books. So they get entire boxes full of books, you know? How could one have too many books? Inconceivable. Inconceivable. <laughs> other, other great, great children's books. I mean, The Prince's Bride by William Golding, of course, and Michael Andy's uh, the never ending story. That's a metaphor for our times. The great nothing, nothing is coming in and destroying the earth and eating it from its edges. Oh man, the great orange nothing will rename it. I don't know if I can ever read that book because I saw the movie oh, when I was growing up, but I was on a lot of pain medicine. And Ooh. let's just say it was a very scary movie on oh. drugs. <laughs> well, it's 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 emotional, but it's always like where the red fern grows, or or, you know, uh, um, Charlotte's Web. They're tear jerkers, but some kind sometimes kids need a dose of reality in their lives. Maybe not. Sometimes crying is okay. Aftershocks every day. <laughs> I I would run and hide under my bed if I could only fit under it. <laughs> I, that's funny i still haven't even felt it enough to hide under my bed usually i'm wide on top of my bed and uh, yeah it's, i guess i'm dead well thank you guys Ken, so much. thank you thanks gentlemen i appreciate it i'm glad we got together yeah me too thank you be safe out there okay will do yeah, okay right. well this button will Bye. go away. Adios, amigos. Adios. Ciao.